I even came prepared today and brought my own water. <laughs> All right, let's dive into the Word of God here. We've been going through the Beatitudes in chapter 5, and we are now in Matthew chapter 5, and we are at where Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And I, as I was thinking and praying about this message this week, I um, want to make sure that we get the understand, and understand the gravity of what Jesus is trying to say that how important Jesus is. This is the first sermon that Jesus gives, the very first thing that he says to a group of people like this, and how important it is to him. And, and I was reading some of John Piper's work, and I want to quote something to you that I think is, and this is my heart as well. When he was preaching on the Beatitudes, he said, I want to impress upon your consciences this morning with as much earnestness as I can, that Jesus is not making optional suggestions in the Beatitudes. And this sermon is not a series of suggestions on how to make the world better. On the contrary, Jesus is describing the pathway to heaven. And this sermon is a message from God to urge you to get on that pathway and stay on that pathway so that you can be called sons of God at the last judgment. That is what is at stake this morning. If you are on the narrow path which leads to life, my purpose is to help you stay on it. And if you are still in the broad way that leads to destruction, my purpose is to direct you to the path of life. And all through the Beatitudes, we're seeing that, that Jesus has raised the bar. He has raised the standards. He, it's not just do this and do that. He's saying that blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are clean. Even though none of us are really clean. He's saying blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Humble, meek, those things. And none of us fit that standard. And what he's been saying is nobody can reach the kingdom of heaven unless they have been radically transformed and changed through faith. Nobody. And then we get to this passage where it says, Blessed are the peacemakers. It's Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, I believe. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we need to understand today what does he mean by peacemakers. This seems fairly self-explanatory, but I want to look at some other passages where the Bible uses the same kind of language so we can kind of get the gravity of what is happening here. So let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus has brought peace. Jesus made peace between us and God. We did not make peace between us and God. The Bible says that Jesus made peace between us and God. And here's a little thing that we need to look at it says through his blood on the cross peace is not something that you can do without some sort of sacrifice it cannot happen if we are going to be a peaceful people it will cost us something it costs jesus his very life it cost him his peace in physical life he was tortured he was ridiculed he was mocked he was beaten and then, to top it all off, they stripped him naked and put him on a cross and killed him so that we might have peace with God. And now Jesus himself is telling us, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In Isaiah 52, in verse 7, it says, this is how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And here it is, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So the idea of those people that actually proclaim and long and love peace, the Bible says those people are considered beautiful. Their feet are beautiful in the sight of the Lord. 
peace. In fact, Jesus goes, or the Apostle Paul goes far to say that we actually have a role in this now. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, it says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, and then here it is, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It is our responsibility to seek peace in the church, in our homes, in the world around us. It is our responsibility as Christians to seek peace. Now, I actually think that this is one of the single-handedly most important messages that we can give in today's day and age, and primarily in our church and primarily in our area. And the idea is this, that peace is something that we should long for. We should love. We should desire. In fact, Alan was talking about this very thing in Sunday school, how there is something about our community that helps us reach the world. And one of those things in our community that helps us do that is by the way we interact one with another. And if we cannot learn and we do not learn to interact with one another in a way that is becoming a Christian, that is always longing and seeking peace... The world looks at that and says, I can get all this battle, all this war without Christ. How, why in the world do I need Christ in my life? The church is to be a home for peaceful things. It's to be a home for, uh, for not necessarily a lack of conflict, but it's supposed to be a place where a refuge, where you can go and find peace. I've been a member of churches where you almost didn't want to go to church because you knew at church somewhere along the way someone was going to butt heads with you all the time. It was constant battle all the time. But we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. There and here, let's just really throw a wrench in it. There is no relationship in our lives that is too far gone that we cannot reconcile with God's help. Zero relationship. There is nothing that we cannot forgive. There is nothing that we cannot look past. There is nothing that we cannot say that I forgive you and I love you and I want peace with you. There is no action that someone can do to you that we cannot forgive and seek peace. And in fact, the scripture is very clear that the only way the only way we have real peace in our lives is through our reconciliation with God let's look at Isaiah 48 verse 22 it's very this one's a very vague verse it's very hard to understand there is no peace says the Lord for the wicked pretty vague right hard to understand that for those of us who do not strive for righteousness and hunger for righteousness and seek to live a pure life. There is no peace for the wicked. They are constantly in conflict, and we see this in the world. If you know people who are unbelievers, you can see this. It seems like every person you talk to is exhausted right now, and they're beaten down, and they're wore down, and they're so full of hurt and angst and anger because there's constant conflict in our world. It doesn't matter where you look. Constant conflict. It's in our politics. It's in our homes. It's in our churches. Everywhere you look, there's this constant battle where it seems like all we ever do is bicker at one another constantly. And that is a behavior that is not becoming Christian people. And the Bible is very clear that there's no peace for the wicked. None. Peace is something we should long for in the church. Desire, work towards, sacrifice for. But I want us to understand a couple of things because there have been some people in the world that think that if we as Christians should seek for peace, that that means we should compromise on biblical 
standards and biblical understanding, and that cannot be. We need to make some distinctions about peace. And the first distinction we need to make and need to understand is peace is not always possible. Peace is not always possible. I want to look at a verse. Again, this is one of those fun ones that I didn't give Janelle. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Apostle Paul it says this to the Romans, the church in Rome. He says, if possible, so as far as it depends upon you, live peaceable with all men. If it's possible, as far as it concerns you, be at peace with all men. Live peaceable with all. There's a phrase that I read this week that I want us to be understanding. He says, we need to make sure that we don't, under, we don't confuse the idea of peacemaking with peace achieving. That we can strive for peace, and we can push for peace, and we can sacrifice peace. But attaining peace may not always be possible, and we'll get to that reason why in a minute. Now, the Apostle Paul starts off that verse by the words, if possible. That indicates that standing for peace, standing for truth, if we stand for truth in some place, peace may be hard to find in areas. If you're going to stand on biblical principles, trust me, peace is difficult from time to time. Peace does not come at the expense of truth or our allegiance to Jesus and his word. If peace requires you to say something and believe something that is contrary to the scriptures, avoid peace like the plague. If peace requires you to compromise what the Bible says very clearly, avoid it. We cannot seek peace at the expense of truth. It cannot happen. Another one, we must not sacrifice righteousness for peace. We cannot, if someone says that in order for us to have peace one for another, you must go do this sinful act, you should run away. You should avoid it. There's a verse that I want us to here and understand it's in the uh, book of James says it's James 317 it says this the wisdom from above is first pure then it's peaceable wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable first pure then peaceable there's an order that word then is a chronological thing if we're going to be wise, we're going to be pure first, then peaceable. We cannot forsake our desire to live righteous lives for peace's sake. It's not the other way around. In fact, this is what I love about the Bible, is the Bible tends to, or always does, I'm trying to be too kind there, but the Bible always reconciles with itself. And actually, so you see James saying that wisdom from God is first pure, then peaceable. And if you actually look at our Beatitudes, we start with blessed are the pure in heart, and then it goes to blessed are the peacemakers. Even Jesus said that purity comes before peace all the time. In fact, if we desire, the Bible says that all those who desire to live rightly in this day and age will suffer persecution. There will be times where peace is not possible if we desire to live godly. Purity before peace, but we should always strive, always struggle towards peace. We should always seek for peace, always seek for reconciliation. And this works out in very practical ways. I have a pastor who was my pastor for 18 years. And let us just say that we did not leave on what I would call wonderful terms. 
Okay, they were awful terms. The man accused my dad of being a false prophet, a false teacher. He said all kinds of nasty things. I really, really didn't like the man. And one day, as I'm, it wasn't preparing for this message, but as I'm preparing and reading for a school project, it dawned on me that part of the reason why I was having so much struggle finding peace in my own life is I spent most of my time angry at a man that I had, don't see anymore, ever. And again, you hear the verse, there is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. And if you remember that opening quote, God is not giving us a bunch of mere suggestions. It's not like he's saying that, well, you know, maybe it would be a good idea if you sought for peace in life. He's saying that we should always long and look for peace whenever possible. That when I feel like someone has wronged me in the church, that I should always seek for reconciliation. Jesus actually was very very animate about this idea of reconciliation, this idea of relationships being restored. He didn't play around with it. There was one passage where Jesus says this, if you are at the altar giving sacrifice, that would be equivalent to, he was talking to Jews at the time, that would be equivalent to us worshiping. If you are worshiping before the Lord, and you realize that a brother has ought against you, then you should leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and make amends. And then come back to your worship. You get the gravity of that? He's saying that that he's talking to Jewish people, and it's the same. He's talking to the church here. And what he's saying is, if you're coming to church, and you're worshiping, and you know that there is tension between you and another brother, stop worshiping, go make it right, then come back to your worship. Don't even bring a sacrifice to praise to me until you've figured out that part. How many of us do that? You notice my hand didn't go up either, right? That's, that's what we're called to. The relationships within the church are to be sacred. That's why we talked about community in Sunday school today. Relationships in the church are sacred. And if you were in Sunday school class, you would have realized that it directly affects our knowledge and understanding of God, our relationships one to another. We cannot truly know God until we are in good community with one another. It also affects our relationship to how we change. We cannot deeply change without good, solid Christian relationships one with another. And that raises another question. Do you know that you and I need to deeply change all the time, constantly, and the only way that that happens is through our relationship with one another in the church. And we cannot truly reach the world without the relationships of the church being whole and right. We cannot truly reach those around us until we figure that part out or at least strive and struggle and constantly battle to have right relationships with the people we hold most dear we can't love God we can't change and we can't reach the world without at first seeking for peace within the church you see how important the Bible puts this idea of relationships within the church church is not designed to come in hear a short fat bald guy preach and go home 
That is not the purpose of the church. The church is designed to bring community to people. And if we cut each other down constantly, why would the world want to be a part of that? Why would the world want to be a part of some place where there's constant strife and battle? Now, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that we cannot confuse peace with a lack of conflict. I'm going to make a statement to you, and it's going to sound kind of counterintuitive, but I believe it's true. And the statement is this. Conflict is a necessary tool in the church. It is. Let me tell you what the Bible says. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We got some hunters in here. Anyone ever, if you've ever had to sharpen a knife to field dress something, if you've ever had to sharpen a tool for your farming, if you've ever had to sharpen something as iron sharpens iron, you will know one thing is abundantly clear when you are sharpening your tools. That that is not a peaceful process. You take a piece of iron on a wheel, sometimes on a wheel, sometimes on a flat stone, but if you're on a wheel and you put that piece of iron on the wheel, there's sparks flying everywhere and there's heat and there's friction and that heat and that friction produces a sharp edge. That's the image that God is giving us in that passage. As iron sharpens iron, as you run iron against iron and beat it and push it and sparks fly and tensions rise and friction ensues, eventually when done correctly, the blade is sharp. I worked in a meat locker for a number of years. I also learned another principle that if you do not sharpen a blade correctly, it is not very helpful at all. In fact, it ruins the knife. It's almost impossible to get an edge on the knife again after you've done that. It's almost, it, it literally is. Like, you have to go and start from scratch. And if we don't handle conflict correctly within the church, we will ruin people. We will destroy them to the point where it will be a pure Red Sea category miracle if we can restore them. I'm a big Ronald Reagan fan. Any Ronald Reagan fans in here? Don't raise your hand. Oh, everyone raise your hand anyway. We don't try and get too political in here. It's a bad place to be. But Ronald Reagan had some great one-liners. Ronald Reagan said this. He said, peace is not absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. That is true in the church. Ravi Zacharias put it this way. He said, we can always disagree with one another, but we must never be disagreeable. We must never come into a disagreement in the church or anywhere else wholeheartedly embracing the idea that because you have a differing opinion than me that you're evil or that you're wicked or that you don't bear the same image of God that I do. We must always embrace the conflict through peaceful means. So that leads me to a couple of questions that I want us to ask some very deep questions of ourselves and then we'll take communion the first one is this going back to our original quote are you at peace with God are you on that narrow path that leads to righteousness like Jesus said because the Bible is very clear apart from that peace with God you can have no peace on this earth none it's impossible 
Are you at peace with God? Have you looked and said, Jesus, I am a wreck and I need you. I need your help. I need you to make me like you. If you've not done that, it's a very simple process. It's a simple saying, Jesus, I cannot do this on my own. I place my trust in you and follow him. Are you at peace with God? This one is going to be a little harder for some of us. Do we love and long for peace or do we relish in the fight? There are some people that just like to fight. They just love it. They just want to constantly battle and bicker. That should not be the default position of a Christian. You should seek for peace first. If you are that way, please, please seek the Lord and ask him to change your heart and change your attitude, change the way you see and think of the world. Because you will never really truly understand peace in your own heart until you learn to seek peace with those around you and peace with the Lord himself. Have you recently or have we recently carried on a conversation where the goal was to persuade one person against another? Have we carried on a conversation where the sole purpose of that conversation was to pit one person against another? The Bible is pretty clear what that is. That's called dissension or division. We have multiple passages that deal with this idea of division and dissension in the church. Let me just give you a couple of them. Titus 3, 10 through 11 says, As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him anymore. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. I think that one's explanatory enough. I don't think we need to go into the next one. There's multiple passages we could use, but the Bible is very clear. Those who seek division in the church, we're to note them, understand who they are, give them ample opportunity to repent. And if they won't, one verse says don't even eat at the same table with them. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. Don't get mad at me. It's what it says. They don't take this division in the church lightly at all. Jesus said it's better for you to tie a rock around your neck and jump into a lake than to cause harm to one of his little believers, one of his disciples, one of his loved ones. It's not to be taken lightly. Well, let's just keep going. Have you considered leaving the church over non-doctrinal issues? Don't get me wrong. There are reasons to leave a church. If at any point you think that I am preaching heresy and you come to me and say, I believe this is heresy and I reject that and I sit there and I keep on going and you actually believe that I'm preaching heresy, then by all means you should leave the church. You should never stay in a church that you believe is preaching heresy and heretical teaching. You should never stay there. There are reasons to leave a church. But if those reasons have nothing to do with scripture, you might want to rethink some things. If it's because you don't like the music style, I can understand that. If it's because you really just can't stand a particular person, I can understand that too. But the Bible seems to be abundantly clear that... How do we do this? In the, in the New Testament, there was no such thing as, I don't like this church, I'll go to the next one. That wasn't an option. 
wasn't even an option. You were either a Jew, a pagan, or one of these wicked Christ followers that everyone talked about. Those were your options. You didn't get to say, well, I don't really like that style of worship, and I don't really like that group of people, and they're just this and that, so I'm just going to go pick another one in town. wasn't an option. You learned to love the people that God put in your life. And let me tell you, God puts people in your life that drive you insane. My dad even told me, he goes, there's always going to be at least one person in your life that if you were to have your choice, you would not spend any time with that person. And usually that person is the one who wants to spend the most time with you. And God did that for a reason and a purpose. And you getting up and walking out because of that is actually deflating the purpose of God in your life. He did it for a reason, to rub you and change you and cause conflict so that you become a better person. That's the way it is. That's why it's there. Stop trying to run away from it. Embrace it. Learn to love it. This is one of the hardest verses in my life. I've never under, I've had a hard time understanding is when David said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you know what the rod and the staff of a shepherd was for? It was not for comfortable means. And it was not for peaceful means. The rod was a club. And when one sheep would leave the flock, the shepherd would throw the club to break the sheep's arm, leg. They don't have arms. That was the purpose. Big club. <laughs> broken. And David's saying, thy rod and your staff, they comfort me. Seek me and know me and see if there's any unclean thing in me. Constantly embracing the correction. When David was confronted with his sin with Bathsheba, he falls to his knees and he looks at God and says, against you and you only have I sinned. God puts these things in your life to make you more like him. To change you. To rub you. Trust me. I'm aware that I rub a few of you guys the wrong way. I had a friend, sorry, it's memories coming back. I had a friend in my life who, for the longest time, he, he, I worked for him. He's a wonderful believer, but he was what we would call rough around the edges. He wasn't exactly what you would call the smooth, couth, fit right in with the church kind of guy. He just wasn't that. And he always viewed his role in the church to be this antagonist. And he looks at me, I said, Denny, why do you always, why are you always just like pushing people's buttons all the time? And he goes, you want to know the truth? I said, yeah. He goes, because I think my calling is to be the church hemorrhoid. I'm not going to define that. I'll let you guys think that through. I love helping people realize where they need to work on some stuff. And this is the big one, and I want to end with this. Have you continued on with your worship in church knowing that there is ought and tension between you and someone else in the church? There is nobody that I know that has done this well. In our effort, in our effort to not want to make a scene, in our effort to keep things calm, instead of addressing the problem correctly, we tend to just let things stew underneath. We tend to let emotions build up underneath until one day what happens is that tension turns into an explosion that tension turns into bitterness 
and you find that you would just as soon not be in the same room with that person, let alone call them a brother and sister in Jesus Christ. That's a bad place to be. Seek for peace. Now, when you're trying to address those tensions, the goal is not to walk up to that person and say, see, I'm right, you're wrong, get over it. That's my, that, now let's have peace. That's not really the way this thing works. I'm going to fall off this stage. That would be bad. You notice I'm still in a boot. I might need two of them before the Sunday's over. That's not the point. The point, again, from the beginning, peace always costs you something. It is never without sacrifice. Let's bow our heads for a second. This subject is so personal to me and so important, and I think it's necessary. Before we take communion, the holy table of the Lord. That if you have aught with another person in this church, today is the day to seek for peace. Today is the day to make amends. Today is the day to not let another moment go by with that root of bitterness starting in your heart. To not grab that root of bitterness by the root and pull it out, cast it before the Lord, and be done. And I ask you before we take communion to take a few minutes. Ask the Lord to search your heart and search your mind. Search your soul. And see if there's someone whom you have aught with. And I encourage you today, sometime today, go make it right. I do not believe that the Lord will allow this church to grow at all. If we don't mend our relationships, if we don't begin to make reconciliation where it's due. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everyone's relationships in here are awesome and great and we don't have any problems. But we should ask the Lord that. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as a church. God, we humbly prostrate our hearts before you. And God, if there is division and bitterness and conflict within the people of this church, Lord God, let us first seek to make amends with that. God, I ask with all my heart that you would convict our hearts in this issue. That as we sit here, that you would right now begin to make heavy the hearts of those of us who have aught against another brother. That we would not let another day go by, another minute go by, with that kind of tension between us. God, let Big Springs be the church that carries the torch of the ministry of reconciliation. And we can portray to the world that just as we have been able to reconcile with each other, Lord God, that we can stand as the Apostle Paul, stand on the hill, and say, we plead you and beg you, be reconciled to God. Give us
us clean hands and pure hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.